Fire Spinner Chapter 7 Rain After Storm So how much further, Reeds? Roy asked, accepting a tin mug full of hot soup from Mrs. Blythe. We covered a fair stretch of ground today. We getting close? We're about two ridges from Mete's grave, Mr. Harper. Reeds passed his brother a mug before keeping O'Hara's second offering for himself. We should be there by midday tomorrow. Roy harumphed in acknowledgement. Grunt and Nora settled on a log nearby, Grunt taking a moment to swing his end of the log further under the overhang they were using for shelter. Marshall emptied the cook pot and set it out in the rain to start soaking. For a moment, the six of them just shared in companionable silence. When he finished his soup, Roy unclipped his buckler, removed its sulfurite from the setting, and tossed it into the campfire to recharge. The heat from the flames dimmed just a bit as the stone started absorbing some of the power into itself. Grunt pulled his greatsword over and worked the lever in the blade to release the weapon's sulfurite, which he also added to the fire. The rest of the group followed suit, except for Nora, who hadn't used her weapon that day. She just watched them as they went through their maintenance rituals, then glanced at Reeds and asked, Why say Mete's grave, Reeds? The son of name is Mete Oaxaca, isn't it? Marshall and Reeds both smiled broadly. That is correct, Reeds said. But the sana believe a thing only exists when it is heard and understood. If I selfishly speak in a language you do not understand, I become less real. So I say Mete's grave, that you may understand and I may exist in truth. So you speak our language to be more real to us. Nora looked very pleased with that answer. That's a lovely thought. Grunt chuckled. Your brother must be in a difficult place, then. Reeds turned stone-faced in a single breath. I speak for my brother. I assure you, he is quite real. Of course, Roy muttered. Marshall is quite fortunate to have such a considerate older brother. Reeds frowned. I am the younger of us, Mr. Harper. Ah, my mistake. Roy brushed his pants off and got to his feet pulled flame from the campfire into his cufflinks and grabbed the pot. All right, people, drop your silverware here. Marshall, could you bring the cups? This time he was watching closely and he saw the byplay. Reeds glanced at Marshall, who raised a finger and tilted his head towards the campfire. Then he got up, gathered the cups, and followed. It was a short walk back to the stream, barely two minutes, and they walked in silence. The light drizzle still fell, but neither man felt put out. When they reached the water, Roy filled the pot and set it boiling with the power in his cufflinks. Marshall produced a rag from a pocket and began scrubbing the cups, dipping them in the boiling water to rinse. Roy fished the silverware out of the pot with his free hand, the heat little more than an irritant. So tell me something, Marshall. He laughed, a belly laugh that set his clothes flapping around his rail-thin body, then pointed at his mouth. Oh, I heard what your brother said back there but you can make yourself known, words or not, no matter what the sauna think. He leveled a spoon at Marshall, an accusation. I've been thinking about you two and this sauna legend since we talked at the saloon a couple days ago. And I was wrong. You're not here to play out the legend of Yosei and Mete, you're here to kill it. Marshall raised his eyebrows and pointed at himself. Yeah, you. Yosei is the older brother, that's why he's named first. I know about the ways Sana speak, you see. Oh, I'm not nearly as proficient as your brother is with Avalon's tongue. Roy let the pot stop boiling. If you two played out the legend, you would kill Reeds, and then you'd be alone with no one to understand you. Meaning that in the eyes of the Sana, you no longer exist, and the legend would disappear with you. Marshall furled his brow and pointed at Roy. I know I said you could make yourself understood. The point is... How other Sana would perceive you, that usually has more import in these kind of mystic events. So is it true? Were you sent to kill the legend? For a long moment, Marshall stared at Roy, the animation draining out of him. Or at least the overly exaggerated mannerisms he affected when dealing with people other than Reed's. Finally, Marshall nodded. They cut your tongue out just for this, or did it happen earlier? He didn't respond to that question. Fine, then. I'm not sure why the Sana chose trying to kill a legend, or why the two of you agreed to the idea, much less your family. But I got a warning for the two of you now. 
Marshall tilted his head, curious. Roy dumped the cooling water back into the river and got to his feet. Don't try to play that stunt out with the Blythe boys, or we are going to have a falling out. Do you understand me? The two men stared at each other. Then Marshall nodded, stacked his cups, and started back towards camp. Roy snorted, not sure what to make of that, and followed after. As they walked, Roy said, I saw what you did on the wall. I presume you're some sort of hero? Or whatever the sauna would call it? Marshall shrugged, an elegant gesture of casual indifference. Right, might of you are medicine men. Roy sighed. Reeds would probably know, but he was much cagier than his brother. Which made sense if Marshall was a genuine hero. Not much was known about them, beyond the fact that they were probably some kind of earth magic made manifest, and their nature was entirely instinctual. So long as the hero had conviction in their cause, they were almost unbeatable in combat. That bit about conviction was really the key. The surest way to overcome a hero was to break their conviction. The best way to avoid people breaking your hero's conviction was to keep the fact they were a hero a secret. So it was something they rarely shared, even with allies. The worst bit about heroes was how little control they had over their own power. It was hard for anyone to control their own convictions, and heroes were no exception. Maybe it was better if he didn't bother asking Reeds anything and just proceeded on the notion that Marshall was one. It didn't make a big difference in his plans going forward. Roy was jolted out of his reverie when they came up on the campfire again. He quickly offered the sign of the hearth before taking his seat. He meant to face Mrs. Blythe as he did so. It was customary to present the sign to a hearthkeeper when they were present. But at some point, she'd offered her seat next to Grunt to O'Hara. To his great surprise, O'Hara offered the traditional response, making a zigzag with two fingers that she then held up in a V-shape, creating the funnel cloud-shaped sign of the storm. Grunt laughed. You've become a devout man in the last few years, Hop. People change all the time, Grunt, he said with a smile. Or did you forget, Mr. Solicitor? Fair enough. Is devotion why you dislike people calling you Giant Killer? Nora asked. Roy scowled. I don't like it, because it's not true. There's a grand total of three giants in the history of Avalon, and only one of them was ever slain by mortal man. Assuming you accept Arthur started out human. A Wendigo was a terrible creature, to be sure, but it ain't got anything on Everest walking. Reeds leaned forward, interested. Indeed. I understand that Wendigos grow in size equal to the amount they eat, and thus are never satisfied. During the Summer of Snow, a group of them supposedly wiped out Tin Gulch, a town with over 200 people. The creatures that did it must have been enormous afterwards. Not as big as you'd think. Roy held up the beads of his necklace, each about five inches long. These are made from the finger bones of the Wendigo I killed. It was about four times the size of a man. Big, but not a giant. Marshall laughed, and Reeds asked, What would you call a giant, then? The smallest of the brothers walking was Shenandoah. You can still see his bones to the east. Reeds laughed this time. The Shenandoah Mountains have existed for generations. We did not name them because of some Avalon tale. Yeah, well, we didn't know they existed 900 years ago either, Roy said, smiling as well. These were mysteries he loved pondering in free moments himself. Legends aren't always true, and when they are, they're rarely the whole truth. But in this case, well, the tale said our lord in raging skies chased Shenandoah Walken in the direction of the Middle Kingdom, and slew him somewhere there. It's more likely Shenandoah only made it this far before he was killed. I didn't like we knew this place existed at the time. And how were we to know the name of this dead giant? A good question I can't answer, Roy admitted. But our lord also pursued and slew Shenandoah's brother, Kilimanjaro Walken, in a land to the south of Avalon. He smote Kilimanjaro so hard he was buried up to his neck in the dirt. And you know what we find down there in Nubia? Reeds frowned. A mountain named Kilimanjaro? I'm surprised the Teutonic wizard wasn't aware of that, O'Hara said. It was Johann von Hielman who mapped Kilimanjaro and noted the connection. Most Teutonic wizards don't think much about Avalon's history, Roy said. I wouldn't really expect them to. Reeds nodded. 
The tradition is mostly theoretical. What history their books do teach are more interested in connecting things to the Forever Wars. Regardless, if a creature that leaves mountain-sized bones is your standard for giants, I can see why you wouldn't think of a Wendigo as one. Marshall nudged his brother's arm and held up three fingers. The third giant was named Everest Walken, Roy said, anticipating the question. He was killed by an alliance of Arthur, the last man of worms, his mentor, Merrill of Linz, and Arlene in Burning Stone. His death was such a cataclysm that it carved the Everest Channel between Avalon and the Franks. That's how Arthur earned the favor of the Lord and Lady and became the Phoenix Born. Sounds complicated, Reed said. It is a famous story in Avalon, O'Hara said. And it's particularly important to druids and hedge mages, as Arthur learned a lot of the craft he used to form the Stone Circle and organize modern druidry from the Lady as part of his reward, for aiding her in the battle. And of course, that's why the mated pair are the patron gods of Avalon, Grunt added. O'Hara offered a vigorous nod of assent. In a manner of speaking, Roy murmured. How so? O'Hara demanded. Our lord and lady are guardian deities to the nation, and they did offer special powers to Arthur because he aided them in special ways. Becoming the phoenix born, walking as one with a storm. Roy shook his head wondering if those titles of Arthur's had any significance or if they referred to aspects of his power and rule that were now long forgotten. But much of the rest of what they offered him, they offered to everyone. The Lord and Lady are intercessors between people and the raw elemental forces of magic. The first elements are incredibly dangerous and don't have any concept of humanity and what is good or bad for them. And that makes any kind of understanding with them difficult, if not impossible. The Lord and Lady place less risky more human magic in the reach of those who follow their teachings. This is what you call druidry? Reed asked. No, druidry existed before Arthur, but he took it and organized it, made it safer and easier for people to get a handle on. It wasn't exactly safe, still ain't, but it's better than what was. That's why the people we consider real druids now come out of the Great Henges. Stonehenge, Ayers Henge, the Dreamhenge, Raj Henge, and, until ten years ago, Moraine Henge. You're very knowledgeable, Mr. Harper, Nora said. After the Battle of Five Ridges, I had a lot of time and motivation to learn. And I happened to be in the right place to get a start on it, too. Roy shrugged. I managed to learn a little from the Moraine Henge druids, but they weren't exactly fond of people in Colombian uniforms at the time. The broad strokes of the story is all I know. I'm not sure what Arthur changed that made the Stone Circle a better way to produce druids. Or how he improved on the magic. If we find him, and he don't kill us, General Old Fathers could probably explain those things much better than I. Yes. I believe I could. Firespinner is written, illustrated, and performed by Nate Chen.